to listen to some of the some of our our dear friends, our beloved. Get up here and, and open up the book of Revelation, the book that Adrian alluded to is rarely studied and is often considered confusing because every guy and his dog has his own opinion about it. And so rather than let the scripture tell you what the scripture means, so let God be the, the revealer, we often say, well, I, um, I think he means this. <laughs> or I think he means that. And it, as a result, over the years, especially recent years, the level of confusion has just, it's been catastrophic. And as a result of that, so many of us who should have been in this wonderful book a lot have stayed away and treated it like the plague. <laughs> oh, no, that's too... And I have to be, I have to admit, honestly, years ago, that was the one book in the Bible that I had avoided. I was going to say never read. Yeah, I read it very quickly here, there, very patchwork. So, you know, when I started thinking about the throne room and started to prepare my thoughts as to just, just what are we talking about? The throne room of heaven. You know, I used to be in, in business and, and uh, had travelled quite a bit and I've been in the boardrooms and in the conference rooms and in the headquarters of some pretty decent sized companies, internationals, you know, where you've got high flyers and you, you've got to be extremely careful and respectful of these men and women that you're dealing with. <laughs> Your livelihood depended on it in many cases. I was going cap in hand at times when things didn't go right and at other times I was doing all I could to curry favour so they'd buy our product or use our services. So heaven's nothing like that. It's nothing like anything we can imagine, the biggest auditorium, the greatest. It's got nothing to do with that. So as we head into this, um, this wonderful place, what's our reference point going to be? What are, how are we going to think about it? It's not just a large open space, is it? It's an amazing space. It's an amazing place. And one of the problems, I guess I, I, I should add this in, is that many of the things we are going to hear spoken about in the book of Revelation and right now are describing things that are in a dimension we have no idea about. Right. Totally, we know three, maybe four dimensions. We've got time as well, okay? So, can you... I remember reading recently through Ezekiel in the first part of Ezekiel and he was talking about these cherubims that were around about God's throne and I couldn't get my head around how they could just do what they did. They seemed to... And his language seemed to get so complicated that I realised that as I'm reading this, Ezekiel struggling, Lord, to put into words what he's seeing and recognising. He knows some of the things they're doing. They, they kind of just, they didn't walk anywhere, they just were there. I don't understand that. They, they seem to be so mighty and powerful that he often found himself in their presence terrified of them. You know, I wouldn't say that I really am even terrified of God, but these are mighty angels. Angels of extreme and great power. These are not just little cherubims you see stuck on the top of buildings and corners of buildings and maybe a little couple in a cemetery or something. These, uh, you know, these are alarming creatures if we were confronted by them. devil would like to tell you that he's like that, but you can, be rest, you can rest assured that that's not true. You can be confident of that. So, I thought what I'd do is start where Jesus started when he revealed himself, because he is the centre of all that we're going to be talking about, thinking about, looking at. 
isn't he? When we meet him in the throne room, this is our mighty God, creator of everything you and I know and understand. The one who can actually cause you, if he so chooses, to think whatever he chooses. And you can't stop him. He has sufficient power to influence what you do and how you do it. He's done it to kings and to nations, hasn't he? Those of you who refused him, he's removed them from the face of the earth, some of these. They are there no more. And some of us today don't have a lot of fear of the Lord. It's kind of become unfashionable. We don't need to fear the Lord. He's a loving God. And, you know, after a while we attribute to him virtues that are not his at all. And that can become quite dangerous. So many modern writers want to tell us just how, how lovely and how beautiful Jesus is and how, how, how approachable he is. And I, I think we need to be careful as we read this to see something because in our initial first three chapters, he not only is, well, let's get there. I won't jump ahead. So John turned to see who was talking to me and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands there was one like the Son of Man. I think we've heard that term before, haven't we? Uh, Matthew used that quite a bit. And Jesus referred to himself like that. His hair, his head and his hair were white like wool and in fact as white as snow, his eyes were like a flaming flames of fire, his feet were like glowing bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like that of raging waters. Wow. This wasn't John didn't see the same Jesus that he knew back on earth before. He, he, he left before he departed. Wasn't the same, was it? Huh? When you look, his eyes were like a flame of fire. You know, when I saw that, I thought, yeah, hang on a minute, Pete. There is nothing hid from him. He knows our thoughts, he knows our intentions, he knows our motivation. He is able to judge. What does he say? The very thoughts and intents of the heart. He knows what you're up to and he knows why you're there. And then that latter part of that talks about <clears throat> like burnished bronze, it, it, it's, it's, it's reflecting on his capacity to judge rightly and to be judge, to judge as a pure and authoritative judge. He's not ambivalent. He doesn't take things lightly. We might like him to do that, but he doesn't do that. He will not be persuaded. It became a rude shock to me when I realised that God can't forgive sin. Sin, every sin, has to be paid for. You've probably heard me say that before. Every sin. There is no sin that is committed on this earth that, should, that will not be paid for. And there's one or two ways that we know of. Actually, it's funny, when I looked at this, I thought uh, of the situation that uh, Peter and James and John found themselves in. You remember on the Mount of Transfig Transfiguration? Huh? And it, it says there that uh, his face shone. Uh, he... It was so amazing that years later when, John, when Peter wrote his epistle, this is what he said in 2 Peter. It so marked his life just to see the Lord, if you like, totally revealed, not hidden within the body of flesh, but glorified for just a moment. And John said, we were eyewitnesses to this majesty. And John, uh, uh, sorry, Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 
And I'm round about verse 16, 17. And I pick up at the bottom there. We were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For he received honour and glory from God the Father when these words from the majestic glory were spoken about him. This is my son whom I love. I am pleased with him. John, uh, Peter could not forget. And I'm sure John, as a James that was with him, James and John and Peter, they never forgot. All these years later, he's writing and as he, as he thinks again of his wonderful God and Saviour, not just the fellow he knew that was the carpenter's son. He knew him as a man, but he knew him and was a more in great reverence and thankfulness for him as God alone. And you remember too that John was given a, a set of instructions something he was actually commanded to do. Do this. So in verse 19 of chapter 1, he was told to write what you see and what is and what is going to happen after this. Three things. What you see. Now we've just done that a bit, haven't we? We said this is what he saw. He saw the Lord. One of the lovely things in there, I, I have a picture from a... Um, a book, an old book of Pilgrim's Progress. And it's, a, it's a, a wood carving print. It's the way they used to make prints in the old days. Carve it into wood, uh, block print, uh, put ink on it and print it on the paper. It's called, it's, so it's, it, it looks very nostalgic, but it, it's called The Man and the Muckrake. And it just, when I first saw it, it just, it left me shaken, gobsmacked because I recognised what the artist was trying to depict, because he, I, I am sure he was looking here in the first chapter of Revelation. When you see how Jesus was dressed, if you go back and look at that, how do you see he was dressed? In a, in a garment, a cloak, down to the ground, and around his waist, around his chest, was a golden girdle. In ancient Jewish times, it, you probably never even noticed as you read through and you, these things would be just thrown out. A minister or a servant or a priest's office was identified often by the way they dressed. Hmm? Do you remember how John the Baptist was dressed? Hey? Roughly. Not in fine raiment and he was girt about. This image here is a high priest being that we have in, in Revelation 1. He was girt about as the high priest. And he was serving. And that's something when I saw this, the picture contained this, this incredible servant, this high priest's servant, holding in his hands, which you believe, he, he had a crown on his head, so we knew who, who he really was. And he had a crown in his hands, on his hands. And the man before him was in the muck, in the squalor, in, in a pig pen or in, 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 a, in, a, in a farmyard with a rake. I don't know what on earth he might have thought he was looking for. But if he'd only stood up, if he'd only looked up, the servant would have crowned, the king would have crowned him, the lord, the high priest. The Lord himself would have crowned him. And that's a picture I've had in my head of how the Lord seeks to serve us. His whole ministry, when he came to earth, was, to, yes, to serve God, indeed. And he did that perfectly. But he came to serve us. And... We could spend the whole of the morning looking at how he is our great high priest. We alluded to that this morning, didn't we? Yeah. And if we could just stop and, and, and spend time looking how he has entered into the heavenlies on our behalf and offered sacrifice payment for us. This is his ongoing ministry for us at the moment. 
this is who John saw. But this now, anyway. Well, so what John had seen was the Lord himself in all his wonderful glory. And he saw also what is. What, what do we think was the what is? Hmm? The letters, yeah, yeah. What, what, what we've been spending the last uh, three or four weeks, what is, is the churches. And those churches uh, were real churches. They weren't fictitious or imaginary. They were real churches in real situations. I want to kind of pass by that in a minute, so I won't spend time here. But he was to write down what is and also what is going to happen after this. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful outline in that simple verse of the whole of the book of Revelation. Right? And I think just if you pay attention to the, um, that phrase, after this, after this, that's the key. And if you look for it, you're going to find it many times in the book of Revelation. And it, it, it's going to signify often a complete change of circumstance or it's going to signify to us something even more, uh, an increasing, an adding to. All right? so, one of the, so we've got an outline that helps us, a clear outline, and we've got a clear focus that the purpose of, of the book of Revelation, that's what the apocalyptic literature is all about, isn't it? It's about what comes next, coming events. And there's the focus of it after this. Now, you know, the, there's much that's been said about what comes after this, but I think it behoves us to put aside what other men seem to think and listen to what Jesus says because he's telling it as it really is. Okay. It's funny as I was thinking about this that, that this is Christ's own story. It's, him, it's God telling it. It's not us kind of trying to figure it out. He's actually telling it. So I would expect, and I hope you do too, that he's been very thorough. Mm. And in so doing, doing that, I was thinking about it, I think, wow, you know, God created the world and, God, and man rejected the creator, didn't they? Didn't we? Don't we? So God chose a nation and that nation rejected him as well. You know, I, I, when I was thinking about it, I thought, oh, wow, we'll, ha we'll have no other king but Caesar. They didn't want God. They rejected their very, very one who brought them out from Egypt, who separated them out from amongst the, the horde of nations to become his testimony to the world. And through this nation, he was going to bring about redemption. He was going to bring about life for all men out of this what we've just been reading is God called individual men, the church. And where we finished off last week, we discovered, amongst other things, the church has ejected him. Now that requires to look into that a little more. We could spend hours, just not just here in Revelation, but in so many places to, to, to learn how, we, how we've gone about it. I'm not going to do that this morning. I want to keep moving. But Adrian aptly warned us about the dangers of how we, how we eject or reject him. Because we end up reading, don't we, where he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Talking to the church of Laodicea. And you suddenly realise he's outside the church, not in the church. The church was supposed to be gathering to him and he's not there. So what on earth are they doing there? Anyway, I pointed out to you 
that uh, we saw... Oh, okay, let me just... Uh, that was kind of just something I, I looked at myself and thought, you know, we can kid ourselves. I can kid myself that things aren't the way they really are, that they don't kid the Lord. He has a very clear view of how we are, what we are doing. He knows our thoughts and he knows our intentions. He knows our will. And, he's, and actually what he said of us is that our, the thoughts and intentions of our heart are only evil continuously. Without God, there is no hope for us, is there? But if, if we... Ah, allow, if we allow him to make us his own, there is hope indeed, unlimited hope. Messiah Jesus in all his glory is the one that I wanted you to focus on right now. Why don't you see him as a prophet? He's the one that is telling us what is to come. He's made it very clear. You see him as the priest ever making intercession, not only uh, for the church, but for individuals. Can you think of ways that that would apply to you? I think that the blood of Christ intercedes for us continuously, doesn't it? Hebrews says that. And John, in his epistles, says, uh, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. On what basis does he do that if I just said he can't do that? As our great high priest, he has offered a sacrifice to God in his own blood that was acceptable to God. So he's not only the high priest over the churches as he, as he seeks to, to teach and to guide and to instruct, but he He's our high priest personally. And we, we desire, I hope, I trust, we desire to, to gather to him, to be found in his company, so that he can care for us and teach us. And his desire is to love us. This is not an unwilling servant of God as a priest. Of, but here, from here on in, as we progress now, we're going to see him as the king. As we move into the throne room, that images that we saw in chapter 1, particularly of, the, of his hair and his, his eyes and his feet, we're going to see him now and, and we're going to begin to uh, see Christ as the king, the ruler, the judge of all men. We're going to see him... Um, examining and bringing his judgment to mankind. And particularly as we go along after chapter, uh, chapter 5, we're going to see the Lord bringing about his judgment upon all men over the whole of the earth. And if you, if you read it, it's a very sobering thought. Just before we leave... Um, the book of Revelation, just to kind of, uh, how can I put it, the, the, the first couple of chapters, I mean, and before we get into the throne room, um, I just want to um, kind of, let me see if I've got it here. We put together a chart, or oh, Sandy did, I don't want you to read it all, I, I have no, it was just my prompt, actually. But if you'd like a copy of it, you can come and get it. Um, but that chart, was a, going through each of the letters and, and putting it together and seeing what was said as commendation, what was said uh, as concerns, what was said as an exhortation to them, you know, down the right there and across the top of the churches. And the things, you know, when I looked at that little, the second row, was the character of God, of Jesus, as he presented himself to the church. And each Time. One of the astonishing things that comes out, each time he presents a certain aspect of his character, it's directly to, related to how the church is functioning or not functioning, how the church is thinking or not thinking. How so he, 
he de deliberately presents himself at times as with, with his eyes of judgment, that he can see through what you're doing. There are other times you see him with a hand, with the, he's speaking about his hand of power and authority. For the church itself seemed to think that it was all, it was all about it, and it's not, it's about him. The two things that, there were three things there that really stood out to me, and I thought, well, let, I need to remind myself of that. You know, out of the, uh, out of the five churches, there were two churches that he had no commendation for. Nothing at all to say good. Can you imagine what that, might, that would be like? That the Lord who redeemed us and made us his own has nothing good to say about us as we gather together and call ourselves a, a community? How does he feel about the way that? And then out of all all the churches he has concerns about, only two out of the seven churches does he have no concerns for. There's nothing to say that, we're, that he's concerned about. That's astonishing. That's over 70% of the church he has great concerns over. The way they're going and what they're doing and why they're doing it. I think as I looked at that chart, it just... This sobering, because I think we need to remember where we're going. The only reason I'm dwelling here for just a moment is I want us to think about where are we going. Is this just off into the throne room and we'll have a quick look around? I hope not. Down the bottom, we put together uh, the various periods in which the church had gone through. And one of the most weird things that occurred, and has always occurred, and most scholars seem to, or Bible teachers seem to agree with this, that each of those churches appear to align with different periods of time in the life of the church universal, in, the univer in, the ch in, in what we would call the Catholic Church, the one church, the body of Christ. And I'm not going to do anything about that this morning, just simply to point out, we all agree that the, uh, the church right down there, the denominational church, is of course the apostate church. Every teacher, every st scholar says that that's what it's at, where it's at. So when you start to apply some of the things, he's got no commendation for it, right? and he has a great amount of concern. You can see what... The church is not today in the condition it ought to be. And so I guess I have to ask myself, and I hope you'll ask yourself, are you in the condition? And are you in the position you ought to be in? Let's go into the throne room. I think sometimes, why, why have I kind of spent my time here for a minute, is that I want us to be sober-minded. Sometimes we become extremely, I do this a lot, light-hearted and casual, ambivalent. Our God is a wonderful God. And we sing these great songs and never sober up and realise that he is the mighty God. The God that sees, the God that judges. And the God that can act and will act. And when he does, men's hearts will fail them for fear. Terror will grip them. He... You know, he wants us to realise who he is. I know that we have the beautiful privilege of not only calling him Father, but he calls us what? His friends. He calls it. So we have there's this incredible dynamic in our relationship, isn't it? We are friends of God. And that's because of our great high priest. Okay. So, after this, chapter 4. I'm losing track. Ah, here we go. After these things, I saw a door opening in heaven. The first voice I heard speaking to me was like that of a trumpet 
Oops, well, I've just lost. And it said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. Instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven with a person sitting on the throne. Hmm? After this. Here's our, if you like, this is our turning point, isn't it? Up till now, what Jesus has been speaking to, uh, to, to us about is what was happening on the earth. Now, we're in heaven. We're in the very heavenlies with God. And I want you to, do, uh, to kind of do a bit of detective work as you go because you, there are lots of things you'll see that you won't understand but I think there are many things there that you will and you need to keep them in mind. We could spend, just here, we could spend a couple of hours just quietly and carefully going through this. And this is one of the great struggles that I, I had as I went to, to put this together for, in a coherent way. Was how much do I leave in and how much do we put out? How much, where do we stop and listen and pay attention? So I'm sure some of you are going to look at this and say, what about that? Maybe we should talk some more later on. I think that we shouldn't treat this lightly. So, what did John see there? Uh, a door open. Uh, and instantly, he was in the throne room. Instantly. Doesn't that... Is that does that ring a bell with anybody, this sudden change? Sudden shift in reality? at a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in an hour that you think not. Twinkling of an eye is not a blink either. Not at all. It's not blinking. So fast did his reality change that the limitations that you and I often experience here because of our physical body, and as you get older you find out what I'm talking about a little more, they're gone. They're just suddenly gone. And John even describes, he says, I was in the spirit. So now he's moved into a reality, God's reality, a reality that cannot be shifted, doesn't change. His reality is the real deal. This reality, as somebody once described it, is a stubborn illusion. And they're now getting to be rather clever in their studies and finding out that this world may actually be something like a, what do you call it, a hologram. That it's, it's something God has created. And when it's, you hear him saying, he can fold it up like a blanket. He can just, just as he stretched it out, he can put it away. This, once this heaven... These heavens and this earth has fulfilled the purpose. We know the scripture tells there is a new heaven. So the time and space we live in at the moment is temporary in the purposes of God. You know, it's pretty solid as far as I can see it. For John, it's instantly, and there he was. He saw a throne room and he saw somebody sitting on the throne. And the person sitting on the throne looked like a jasper, a carnelian, and there was a rainbow around about the throne, like an emerald, looked like an emerald. This, does that leave you scratching your head? Huh? Or did you get that straight away? That is just, oh wow. That's... We could gloss over that, but I want to stop enough to get you to see what, 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 John, what hit John and how big a re reality shift he is he's living in. Yeah, rocks that radiate light themselves, unique light. That word rainbow it could be better translated like a halo. It's meaning that the, the light was actually coming from the, the very centre of the throne itself. And these... 
Some of us see those rocks there that he saw, those stones, or precious stones, as we call the, the jasper and the carnelian, and you realise that names for stones have changed. They do. They have over generations, different people call the same stone different things. And you've only got to go and Google something up. And if you get one of these old names in the Old Testament, you'll find half a dozen different stones all considered to possibly be, we're not really sure. These two stones that they're spoken of, have you ever heard of them before? Those of you who've read the scriptures, have you ever come across them before? Hmm? Hmm. Somebody's been reading. <laughs> yes. Is they, are they, do you remember the breastplate of the high priest? Huh? He, he, he wore over the, the high priest, that is, not the priests, not the Levites, the high priest wore over the front of his vestment, over the front of his outer tunic, a, a breastplate. Nobody has any idea what it actually looked like, but we do know what was on it. There were 12 stones and they represented the 12 tribes. And they have lots, you could say they have lots of significance. You could see things about, from, as you read the scriptures, you realise that it, it, it is depicting the nearness of church uh, Israel to, to God's heart as he stands and ministers day after day before the Lord. He carries them with him the diligence and faithfulness of their God. It says a lot to them. Maybe not to us who... But the first and the last stone are exactly these two stones that are mentioned here. Nobody's really sure about the, uh, the jasper because when I went looking, it could be this, it could be that, it could be green, it, could be, it can be kind of brownie red. It doesn't really matter in a sense in my thinking. It's the splendour, the absolute amazing wonder of, of his, his own presence just radiating out, bursting forth. The things that we would naturally look at as common. And, uh, and in some instances, in our world, worthless. Some of these stones are just what they call them, they're uh, silica. Oh, there are tons of that. Huh? And yet in the presence of God and in, in his presence, they are radiating their full glory. They are revealing themselves for what they are because they're coming from him. I guess for us, that's going to be the transformation, isn't it? Does not yet appear. But someday, and I believe very soon, we will see him as he is and we shall be like him. Does that not make you not only get goosebumps but say, want to say hallelujah? He's, this is what he's done. He has transformed our lowly body, he said. So he made a, a, a tremendous change. It's never going to be trans It can't be reversed. Impossible. God doesn't do that. He is not... A, um, there's an really neat word I came across a while ago. But he, he's capricious. Yeah, I'll do it. No, I'll change my mind. Yeah, I'll do it. No, when God, God's word is what? Yea and amen. Absolute. So when he says we're going to be like him, that's our reality. But I just thought it, it's interesting to see that the very the light that's radiating out radiating out from the throne room of God is also typifying those things that were so precious to him. The people he chose and called to himself. The nation. The nation. So many people want, today want to tell you that God's finished with Israel. Don't listen to them. They're fooling themselves. God isn't finished. You've only got to start getting into the next few chapters after chapter 6, chapter 7, and on it goes and you realise that the focal point in there is around Israel. He, they, and they, the, the scripture even says, the prophets even say, they will cry out to him to come. 
the nation that said, we'll have no other king but Caesar, and they rejected their Lord, will cry out to him, come. And he said, I will come quickly. Yeah? He'll come. That's all he wants to hear. He wants them to realise not only their need, but he wants them to realise who he is and see him for who he is and acknowledge he alone is God and call for him and he will come. Okay, actually there's something interesting when I was looking through this that uh, there, there are 25 thrones there. 25? The Lord and the 24 elders. That's the time we just call 24 and we don't ever count. And I just say, hey, there are 25 thrones. Now, some of your Bibles are foolishly, and I say that very deliberately, some of your translators call them seats. They are not seats and they're not just place, a place to sit down. The word there, thronos, is, is talking about ruling authority the place of majesty and greatness. This is not just the sitting room in heaven. This is the talking about the sovereign place of God's rule. And there are 24 elders sitting around about the throne. Right? More than that, they are wearing white robes and they have on their heads victor's crowns. Do you have any idea who they represent? Have you ever thought about that when you read it? I know over the years I, I, I wondered what were the... Who are they? And I, I, I guess one of the things that, um, that I realised, the one sitting on his throne is indeed Christ the Lord. But at the moment we know he's actually sitting on his father's throne. Don't we? Right? We're told that in Revelation 3.21. He said, to, when he was talking to the church in Laodicea, this, you, you, it just may have flipped past you, you didn't see it. But here, let me read it to you. To the ones who conquer, I will give a place to sit with me on my throne, just as, my, just as I have conquered and have sat down, with, uh, sat down with my father on his throne. Now that's an amazing, if we unpack that one. But it's, I don't want to do that. I just want you to see where, where is he sitting at the moment on his father's throne. Huh? And the, David even said in Psalm 110 that uh, we, we, you may remember, he said, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's sitting on his father's throne. Huh? We often, in Hebrews, we refer to the throne of mercy. We you, know, we, you all know this verse, I think. We alluded to it, or somebody even quoted it this morning, I think. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace, the, the throne of mercy. And that's what we do. That's our, that's our beautiful privilege. So right now, we do come acknowledging his great sovereignty, acknowledging his divinity, his otherness, his holiness, but we have access to come to him through that, through that sacrifice that he has made. So he said, you know, to the throne of ghosts so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. He's also sitting on the throne of David. Well, not yet. He's supposed to. That's repeated over and over in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, you know that, that favourite verse we have, for unto us a child is given unto us. The son, sorry, the child is born, the son is given. Get it right. Huh? 
and he'll be called and the government says a peace will be there'll be no end and then the next verse says he will rule over his kingdom sitting on the throne of David do you realise that when the Lord comes it will be his kingdom that he sets up do you believe that I hope you do. You pray it, or if you say it, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now, I hope that's not just a few words, but a plead. Come, Lord Jesus, come. It comes quickly. So, that's where Messiah is sitting. And the twelve apostles were told by Jesus, weren't they, that they would sit on twelve thrones also. Now, I, I guess what I, uh, where I'm heading here uh, with you is who are these 12 thr- uh, 24 thrones? What are they and who are they? I want you to be sure that you know in your mind who you're looking at. Now, 24 is a very uncommon uh, biblical detail. You've got number. I think the only place I know of it now, Sandy and I were talking about it, uh, and I mucked it, muddled them up in my head, was um, when Moses appointed, uh, David appointed, I did it again, didn't I? When David appointed the 24, the group of 24 from each from each of the, uh, the, the Levites to minister in the, temp- in the temple, in the tabernacle. And he made, made them into uh, for all of the, teams of 24. So each of them had a ministry. That group of, 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 of Levites had a ministry twice a year so that there was no confusion. They each knew when they were on the job or off the job. So we, we, we've got 24 there. But no matter how you squeeze this, you can't get them in here. They don't bear any resemblance. So, one thing we've come to realise, I think and most will agree, they're representative of a complete group. They're not 24 different individuals and they're unique because they keep being referred to that way. And they're not being a good detective, we start to see they're not tribulation believers, are they? Because where are they? They're on the earth. We're in the heavenlies. These things are not yet coming to pass. The judgments have not yet been poured out. The bowls, the trumpets, nothing has happened. We're still in the heavenlies and we're seeing what is to come, aren't we? They're not there yet. And when we get further into chapter 7 and, and onwards, you will hear them, you'll meet them and you'll, be, you'll find where they are. But there's no way that you can get them into the throne room. Yet so many would like to maybe think that they were. Matter of fact, in, uh, uh, in Revelation 7, um, John uh, is asked... Who are these people wearing white robes, looking at the tribulation but the saints? One of the elders asked me. And where did they come from? And then John says, I told him, you know, sir, you know. John wasn't sure. Then he told me, these are the people who are coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So even the saints that die in the tribulation will have to rely on the provision of Christ's sacrifice alone to deal with sin. Those who who come out of the tribulation are going to find themselves totally reliant on Christ alone. But right now, that's not them, is it? So that we've eliminated, um, for sure, our tribulation believers are they angels? 
No, they're not. Because we find them in verse 11 of chapter 7, they're standing around the throne. They're always standing. There is no place for any angel to sit anywhere. They minister night and day. They don't have time to sit down. There is no place for them to rest. And if they're not ministering, they're worshipping and praising in another practical way. So their life is totally evolved around serving and worshipping God. Whereas these 24 elders are seated on thrones that are significant. Okay. So some have suggested to us that it could be uh, the nation Israel. But there's nothing that actually helps us there. We're told that the, uh, the, the disciples would sit on 12 thrones, but they're not mentioned here, are they? Because that is going to happen when? When is that going to happen? When did Jesus say it was going to happen? Hmm? When he comes again, in, when he comes to rule the earth with a rod of iron, they will come with him to rule the nations. They're not here. So we've eliminated, I think, the most common suggestions. Now let's see if we can kind of go a bit further. We know who they're not. Let's see if we can find out anything about them. those that are sitting on thrones. They're wearing white raiment. Hmm? What's that all about? You remember we, I quoted to you a minute ago from Laodicea? He said, in verse 21 he says, To the one who conquers, I will give a place to him to sit on my throne. Just as I sat on my father, father's throne. To that one he's saying that I will, I, you will be dressed in white raiment. And they will sit with him. So white raiment there is talking about what? In initially he said to them, you know, to get, didn't you know that you were naked and poor? To get white raiment. What was he speaking about? Do we remember? The raiment, the white raiment, is, is symbolic of his righteousness that covers our nakedness, our sinfulness. So these men were wearing white raiment, these elders. In, in Revelation 3, 5, uh, to Sardis he said, um, the people who conquer in this way will wear white raiment. He was talking to the, the ones that were overcomers. So, we know that that's the clothing they're wearing, but look at what's on their head. Crowns of gold. The word crown here is not that of a diadem. Right? Uh, so we're not talking about beautiful, uh, glorious, uh, gem-encrusted um, picture of, uh, of, uh, of glory. We're talking about a different thing altogether. Matter of fact, in Corinthians, Paul says, For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive rewards for the things we've done. And the word is, that's there for judgment is the same word that's used in the, in the Greek games, which is the bema, the bema seat. And that's where a laurel wreath was given to those who had won. That was their reward. The victor, the overcomer, the one who prevailed. And he was saluted and he was given a, 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 a crown, if you like, made uh, uh, as a garland he wore around his head as a declaration, as evidence that he was the winner. A big difference between the one who's ruling and the one, isn't it? So we, we know that those crowns of gold directly refer 
to what the Lord promised to those who persevere, to the church, to the believers, we will receive our reward, our crown, the crown of righteousness. There, in the scriptures, there are many, many crowns spoken of. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful exploration to see they are promised to you. And it's always using the same word, which means diadem. Uh, oh, I forgot the word. You're going to say, hey, Stephanus, yeah. That it is Stephanus. It, it's, it is simply the wreath of acknowledge, the, the crown of acknowledgement that you are an overcomer. You're a winner. You competed, as Paul put it one time, that you've competed honestly and correctly. You ran the race legally. You're not a thief and a robber. You're not a deceiver. You're worthy of your reward. And the reward will be more than just well done. This is a place. So this is part of their, 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 um, uh, their dress. They're wearing crowns. But one of the most telling things about who these people are is the song they're singing. Come on, there we go. And if we just skip over to chapter 5 for a minute, they sang a new song. A new song. Actually, you find this song, uh, versions of it, sung again. One of the things these folk like to do, these elders, they like to sing. And the thing that they want to sing about and in this instance, it's when Christ himself opens that seal and takes possession of creation. With your blood, you purchase people from, for God from every tribe, language, people and nation. Isn't that talking about redemption? These are the redeemed. So those sitting on thrones are singing the redeemed's song. They were purchased. They've been redeemed. And that's our place where we will have and we will always have that song in our heart and life. You've done this, Lord. We're worthy. We sung some beautiful songs this morning that echoed these very words, didn't we? But he is worthy. And that's our song. They sang, uh, you you are worthy to take the scroll. You made us. Now, how about this? It's verse 10. You made us kings and priests to our God and we will reign on the earth. You did that to us. Have you any idea now as we've, who these 24 elders are? I hope it's very clear. I hope it's very clear. It should be. It should be easy to see that those 12, 24 elders sitting on thrones, wearing crowns, dressed in white raiment, singing their songs of joy, are the church indeed. They represent the church. And they're in heaven. When John gets there, they're already there. They don't arrive after. He doesn't look over his shoulder and say, oh, what's this? Here they come. No, they're already there. Another giveaway, of course, is the lampstand. Now, if I just skip over, see if I can do that. Right. Burning in the front of the throne was seven flaming lampstands. The lamps were there. Now, what did we learn the lamps were in the beginning? Do you remember? I think I put it up on a slide. This is from Revelation 120, just a bit of the ways back before Jesus directs his, directs his attention and his judgment and his exhortation to the church. The secret meaning, he said, of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the se- seven golden lampstands, that is, the seven stars are the messengers to the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Where are they now? They're in heaven. Now, keeping in mind that the lampstand is just that. It's a lampstand. 
it doesn't give forth light. How would the lamp stand, therefore, as we know the scriptures, don't we? How would the lamp stand? What would cause the lamp stand to be able to light and light up and blaze? Jesus Christ. Huh? Yes, even more so the Spirit. Without the Spirit, there is no life. There is no life. When we talk about... you remember the ten virgins? Five had oil, or speaking of the Holy Spirit, and five did not. Five had light, and they had plenty of it. And in this case, we're looking at the lampstands are blazing. They are well alight. There's no reference to them being like that, in the letters to the seven churches, is there? But here in the glory, they shine forth. Another thing, just for you to notice, were they there before John got there or did they come later? They were there when he got there, when he was told to come. After this was the key. I guess you can realise I'm alluding to something that I've not said much about and I think I, I really, for, in a sense, we could spend all morning just doing that, uh, talking about the rapture, the bringing, the collecting up, going through Thessalonians 1 and 2, but we don't have a chance to really to, to delve into that and it would be wrong and unfair to, to, to kind of abuse the scriptures by not doing it so that you can be confident in, in your own mind because many cu- Christians today have heard such ridicule of this incredible truth that is so commonly today disbelieved by so many Christians. If you believe it, you're in a very minor minor group. It's, uh, It's sad to see. One of the things that we could, I should draw your attention to, is that in front of the throne we find Four living creatures. Four living creatures. I'm trying to squeeze. I'm watching that clock and it's just about killed me. Um, but you can see what I wanted you to see is something wonderful, something amazing. Those four living creatures are actually representative of something that is, should also be known to us if you've read the, uh, through the prophets. In Ezekiel, you find them, but you also... He saw them in heaven. But you also find these four living creatures somewhere else. If you go to Numbers chapter 2, you find, and let me see if I can find it for you, there it is, you find Moses being told to count up who are the the men of, of, of good health and of able to defend the camp. So he counts up, as the Lord said, counts up those men. And this is what he gets. 186,000, 108,000, 157, 151,000 men. And he's told to group them into four groups under the head of Judah, uh, Reuben, Dan and Ephraim. So he's got four groups of three tribes. All right? Then, and what is astonishing as we read this, is going to, it's, I'm not going to be able to explain all of this to you, but I want you to see it's here. It means it tells you where Israel is in the mind of God. He then says to them, this is how I want you to lay the, tent, the camp up. Whenever you pull down the tabernacle and take it and reassemble it, this is what I want you to do. Now, you, you may have read it simply through numbers and not been able to get this picture in your head. In the middle is the tabernacle and around about on equal proportion is the tribes of the Levites, the priests. They surround uh, and are near to serve at the tabernacle and they make up an equal space. It's not a rectangle, it's always to be equal on four sides. And that becomes the measure, the width at which each of the tribes set to the north, sorry, to the south, to to the east, to the north, to the west, that's where they sit, where they line up and and each of them camp there, assemble there. Would you believe it if I told you 
that each of them had an ensign to which they assembled, like good soldiers. Most, even to men, in military today, we have our ensigns and we assemble, and they're precious to us. These were their ensigns. What were these creatures like? They had a face of a man, an ox, an eagle, and a lion. If you were to do this, this is where we'll leave it this morning. If you were to do this, and you flew over the top with one of Adrian's helicopters, look what you'd see. Remember I gave you the numbers? Look what you see. Does that amaze you? That even the Lord could not prevent Israel from knowing him as their redeemer. Just as he couldn't prevent us from seeing him redeeming mankind. And we who were not of the household of Israel have been by his grace drawn in. So there you have it. Now we could spend hours just delving in and exploring together. I want you to go home and explore some of these incredible things that God has recorded for you, for your encouragement, for my encouragement, that he has never forgotten you. He cannot. He will not. Because of Christ. It's not because you're something special or, you, or because you know, he just wants to do that. It's because of Christ. The meeting place for Israel and for us <coughs> is in that holy and heavenly tabernacle. Sorry I've taken so long. But I hope you've been encouraged and you've made a discovery. Where we're going home is an amazing place. We cannot imagine really what home is like. So, and there we shall be forever with the Lord.